Uh, thanks for everybody for uh, for listening in. I really appreciate it. Uh, first, I'm going to start with uh, thanking uh, uh, my co-authors here that helped put the presentation together, Chris Carlson and Peter Jacobson. So we have a lot of great institutional tools that we use to, to leave a legacy on, on lakes. Uh, the first one is uh, the Minnesota Shoreline Management Act of 1969. It's uh, shoreline development standards that local units of government putting in their planning and zoning ordinances. And uh, it really stops a lot of crazy uh, development that may occur. Not to say that some some crazy developments do not occur, but it really uh, provides some minimal set of standards for, for folks. The other one is the Clean Water Act, of course. And if you've, uh, if you've been around in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you knew that many of our waters were on edging on a cesspool or becoming a cesspool. And that really turned things around um, dramatically. Oftentimes we forget all the great work that's been done because of that. And uh, in Minnesota, we've, we're fairly unique. We have the Minnesota Clean Water Legacy Act of 2018. Uh, it was an increase in the sales tax by uh, three eighths of 1%. And it's just amazing how um, a very little portion of something big can really have a meaningful difference in, in, in conservation here. Those funds are for clean water, habitat, parks, and art. There's an outdoor heritage fund um, out to 120 million per year for conservation um, easements, land acquisitions on lakes. And I'll, I'll talk about some of that. In fact, I'll talk about four case um, histories in Minnesota uh, on, on how they've been appropriately using that money. And then the second part of the talk will be about the clean water fund which is about $110 million per year. And uh, one aspect of both of these is both targeting and prioritizing that work. It's just not random acts of con conservation scattered across Minnesota. It should be targeted and prioritized and some rationale behind it. So the, the framework that I'm gonna use um, is expressed in this simple graphic. Uh, first, first comes the science course. Um, and and that's critical, right? It's science-based information based on facts. And as um, Aristotle said, well begun is half done. If you do the science part right and, and are able to get some advocates behind you that build in collaboration, it's just incredible what can be done. Now, again, you have to persevere, you have to endure, and you have to be patient because sometimes it takes a while to get get the gears turning quick enough where you're actually starting to see some action. And in Minnesota, the four cases uh, that I'm gonna show you demonstrate that. So the first one um, is about wild rice. In Minnesota, we are at the epicenter for, for the world for wild rice. Uh, it, goes, it has both cultural re relevance for the Ojibwe that uh, lived here and are living here and harvesting it today, as well as uh, for, for fish and wildlife purposes. So the science on, on wild rice protection, trying to leave a legacy was conducted by Nicole Hansel Welch and her team at the Shallow Lakes Program, where through monitoring and, and regular surveys across the state of Minnesota, they acquired very good information on where wild rice occurs, where, where were some of the outstanding wild rice lakes in Minnesota, uh, how have they changed. Working, with, working um, with an advocate, Dan Stewart, a Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources, he's given a presentation to the partnership. So look at some of the past recordings and you'll see his name. He was a strong advocate for wild rice protection um, he lives near a wild rice lake. Uh, he's, he's got strong interest in it. And he collaborated with Lakeshore property owners, some county SWCDs, Ducks Unlimited and Department. And they objectively ranked uh, parcels using a really good peer reviewed criteria and a, that was administered through a project committee. So there's a, a broad group of collaborators looking at parcels across the state, using the best science and working through it. And through, um, through, through the grants and, and fundings through our Clean Water 
um, legacies. They worked every year on, on acquiring conservation easements or acquiring fee title for some critical habitat uh, adjacent in the shorelands of wild rice lakes. And you can see through time, uh, they've acquired uh, about 5,000 acres total. It's a really great uh, program that each year worked on it, acquired some easements, acquired some acquisition areas, and really left a legacy for our wild rice lakes. Um, the program, this particular uh, program has, has ceased, but it really left a, an important and long-term consequence for wild rice lakes. The second uh, case I'm going to talk about is uh, sensitive shorelines. And not all shorelines are created equal, of course. And we were approached by um, a county in, in North Central Minnesota, Cass County, to say, hey, could you, could the DNR help us identify some sensitive lakeshore such that we could be proactive with new development and put uh, higher standards for development in those particular locations. And we said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So we worked on the science of, well, how do you go about identifying sensitive shoreline? Um, and then worked with the county and other advocates such as the Leachick Area Watershed Foundation and the county, Gas County, initially started there. And as we were successful, we expanded that to include other North Central Minnesota counties and started focusing rather on planning and zoning type efforts to think about um, protecting shoreline um, through conservation easements. So we began working with the Minnesota Land Trust and they became an important um, participant in the process, in fact, critical participant in the process. So our sensitive lakeshore science was um, of extensive biological uh, collections on a, on a suite of lakes within, uh, within the county uh, that included aquatic plant studies, included bird studies, both point count and playback surveys, which I found totally incredible that somebody could sit there on the shore of the lake and identify up to 200 species of birds just by listening to them. It's just incredible um, ear and abilities. And they'd also do playback surveys for our more um, secretive birds, such as some of the rails and whatnot. We also sampled um, systematically random across uh, the shoreline um, uh, um, fish. So here you see us um, backpack electrofishing seining and using trap nets to, to capture mostly non-game species of fish. So here's, a, here's an example of some of the data collected on just one lake. This is uh, fish of greatest conservation need distribution in the lake. We were looking at rare species here with this particular graphic, for example, with pug nose shiner. It's a shiner that looks like it ran into a jet ski, has a pug nose, and uh, Lee starter, which is Minnesota's smallest fish. It's in the walleye family. So if you could collect, it's only about an inch long. So if you could collect a thousand of them then and do a fish fry, it'd be much like walleye. And then uh, then the long ear sunfish. So that's one example here of collecting that data across the lake and finding where their distributions are. And then we also included uh, such things as loon nesting where we had a citizen monitoring network to record and document where loons have been nested in the past or currently nested, both um, natural and artificial platforms. So we used a uh, additive benefits values-based model that uh, summarized uh, many different biological attributes. And then we scored them from high to highest, because as I tell everybody, there is no low sensitive shoreline in Minnesota. It's all highly sensitive, but some is higher and some are highest. So the brighter colors here are the oranges are the, the most sensitive shoreline based on our additives model, based on a lot of the biological information that was collected. 
and then we did a hotspot analysis of those locations so that um, so that they could look at where those areas are clustered and then that's the information that we then provided both to the counties for thought about um, zoning and for areas that they may want to focus a little bit more en energy on for conservation easements with um, landowners that were really interested in leaving a legacy. And then secondly, so our, our, uh, our approach was very labor intensive with a lot of biological data collection. And then we simplified it uh, and developed our rapid assessment model that was based on wetlands, presence of wetlands, hydric soils, and whether or not loon nesting had occurred in that particular segment. And then we applied that rapid assessment model to all lakes greater than 500 acres across a five county area uh, in, in North Central Minnesota. So we could do it rapidly and provide that information with the same level of confidence as a more labor intensive approach. So we had the science, we had strong advocates at the county levels that by the time we were done by at five county areas and beyond that actually, and a very strong collaborative team with the land trusts. And of course, it was critical that the Lakeshore property owners were aware of it. So we were, we were um, giving presentations across that five county area and talking about sensitive shoreline. And the first thing that you do when you put up a map of, of a lake is people automatically look at their property. Oh, oh, I'm in a sensitive shoreline area. Wow, I always knew that. Wow, I might, might now, now start thinking about you know, I've got a large chunk of, of shoreline here. I might want to think about it preserving, preserving my legacy and protecting that shoreline and, and working then with the Minnesota Land Trust and protecting that uh, in perpetuity with a conservation easement. So it was a wonderful project. Uh, it was again funded through our Legacy Act. And, you know, we worked as a team through the years you know, didn't seem like much at first, but at the end of it, we had uh, together, citizens, the land trust in the counties had protected 21 miles of shoreline and some of the best deep water lakes in Minnesota. And it was just really interesting to be and excited to be a part of that project of protecting those areas forever. The third case is um, forested. Lake, lake sheds. And this is based on the science of Tim, Tim Cross and Peter Jacobson, where they had looked at how within a lake's watershed, as it got more developed, more disturbed, uh, you would see a decrease and well, an increase in the mean summer total phosphorus or a decrease in water clarity. And they decided that a, a reasonable threshold was once 75 percent of the watershed was protected, you had seen uh, higher water quality. So that was the threshold they were looking for. Can we find areas where they're close to that threshold and protect some forest so that you could protect those areas so that, that the water would be filtered and, and um, pollution would be minimized through the protection of perennial cover. So the science behind this part was, of course, the science I just mentioned, plus a, a very good storyteller that could, could develop a fisheries habitat plan around that science. So here's Mike Duvall, Pete Jacobson, and others that developed the fish habitat plan. Um, very simple to understand. Again, Dan Stewart, part of the part of the advocacy behind that and his forestry role within Bowser, and then working with uh, both the Minnesota DNR Forestry and the Minnesota Forest Resource Council to really start protecting some of those watersheds in critical areas in the state of Minnesota where there were threats of some of that forest land to be developed. So in the end, um, they protected thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres um, through the Minnesota Forest for the Future for program and, and really allowed working forests to, to provide those ecological 
services of clean water as well as providing forest products. It was really a win-win situation for many Minnesota lakes in the northern part of the state. The uh, fourth and final uh, case history I want to talk about before jumping to part two is how to protect our really cold water species in Minnesota lakes. And uh, we're focusing in here on tulipy or cisco. So Pete Jacobson had done much of this work. In fact, he's also giving a presentation sometime in April, I believe, through the partnership. So look, look for that talk, uh, just fascinating work. I'll just provide a quick summary here. But of course, Minnesota's climate is changing. The world's climate is changing. Lake ice is decreasing and, and that thermal habitat is changing. So what we've already begun to see, of course, and this is long ago, we, we saw that Cisco abundance is declining across the state of Minnesota. And, and this is just looking at our, our, our lake survey data for Minnesota. So in Minnesota, we're um, a fairly unique state where we've got prairies to the southwest and forests to the northeast. And our Cisco lakes are uh, under pressure from two, two land alterating uh, land uses, one being the urban uh, landscape is advancing and, and in many parts of Minnesota, almost surprising to many, is the advancement of the conversion of forest into ag lands, which has really started to accelerate here in the last 10 years. Kind of rem reminds me of some of the same kind of dynamics that were happening in central Wisconsin when I was growing up, but it's happening here at an alarming rate. and. Uh, and what you do about that, and how do you protect these cool cold water species that depend on clear oligotropic waters? So the science was um, Dr. Stefan at the University of Minnesota, Pete Jacobson worked on identifying critical uh, Cisco habitat, and then projecting what was the consequences of development in the lake's watershed to say. Could we expect the lake to still have cool and cold water habitat for Cisco to survive? The advocates, again, were, were the Leech Lake Area Water Foundation initially, and again, working with Chris Larson and others with the Minnesota Land Trust to start working with property owners on Cisco Lakes to think about how to protect some of the lake's watershed so that we can minimize phosphorus from entering the water and decreasing and increasing fertility and decreasing cisco habitat so some of the some of the science here is identified here their results predicted about 67 percent of the current cisco lakes would become not essentially non-cisco lakes in minnesota it'd be a huge loss of that type of habitat for Minnesota, a very critical species for, for Minnesota. The species provides good forage for our, our highly prized game fish, such as walleye, muskie, northern pike, etc. cetera. And uh, with the cli climate changing, uh, some of our lakes are, are unlikely to, to be Cisco lakes in the future. So what they did is they identified those lakes that could maintain Cisco habitat, provided that there was some protection in, in water quality in those lakes. So that's the, that was the mission with very clear science about where spatially and which exact lakes to proceed on. So just some basic science here, you know, as phosphorus enters the lake, um, fertility increases, so you get the decay of organic matter, which reduces dissolved oxygen. Cisco require high levels of dissolved oxygen at, at cool temperatures and uh, with increasing eutrophication the fish gets squeezed and and sooner in some cases the habitat disappears and you end up with actual fish kills of Cisco on the lakes. So they've been they've been working on this for some time it's actually still ongoing and they're having a huge uh, positive 
benefit, really leaving a legacy for for these Cisco lakes that they've been targeting. You know, very specific targets, and working with citizens to protect that water quality in those in those lake sheds. So I'm going to shift gears here a little bit with those four case histories behind us, but I'll circle back to them at the end. Uh, why prioritize? Well, whether it's Michigan, Wisconsin, or wherever, we've got a lot of water and we don't have a lot of resources to work everywhere, right? And the question that's been asked, what, what lakes should we invest in? So we've been struggling with that uh, in Minnesota for some time now, is where should we best put our money so we get our most bang for the buck or the highest return on investment? Uh, up until very recently, the common prioritization approaches that we're been, we've been using is first come or first impaired, first served. And of course, there's always the squeaky wheel where politics are more important. Um, third, those with resources get more resources. <laughs> That's often very common. Uh, the fourth being more of a science-based, ecological or economic or a combination of both. And then overall, uh, uh, various combinations, science, squeaky wheel, et cetera. What we've been arguing for policymakers in Minnesota is try to avoid being arbitrary or hiding your value judgments of how you're making these prioritizations um, to folks so that people can see how is it that you've identified this lake here versus that lake over there for, for some conservation dollars. So we've been providing several lake prioritization tools that local units of government can be used. The first one's been around for a long time. That is, we list the lakes that are impaired. So here in Minnesota, it's Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has an impaired waters list. And that's been you know, the primary means of identifying lake prioritization. The three that we've developed recently, um, we think have some, some applicants application for this as well. One being focusing in on high quality lakes at greatest risk of becoming degraded or further degraded. So we created a tool called Lakes of Phosphorus Sensitivity Significance and I'll walk through that. The other tool we created was uh, with this value, focusing on lakes with high quality biological communities was Lakes of Biological Significance. And then lastly, focusing in on high value lakes that provided the provide the greatest return on investment. And the tool we created there was the Lake Benefit Cost Assessment. So that's just a quick review of those. So on the impaired waters, right now, very recently, 80% of our monies are spent on restoration project of impaired waters. And we've got over 600 nutrient impaired lakes that are primary in the ag zone across the state. So that's where generally we've put a lot of emphasis and a lot of our, our dollars in. The question is, is that, is that a good investment? As, as many limnologists will tell you, once you break a lake, it's very hard to, to, to restore it. So is this appropriate? So let me go through the, the three others. So the lake's of phosphorus sensitivity significance is based on the lake's sensitivity significance and whether or not it has a presence of a declining water quality. So again, we're focusing in on high quality lakes at greatest risk of becoming degraded. So we, um, we developed a limnological model um, that used lake volume, water retention time, mean phosphorus to predict it's the lake's phosphorus sensitivity. And we put it in a unit of measure that people can understand. So how many inches of water quality clarity would be lost if 100 pounds of phosphorus was dumped in the lake or about 23 bags of fertilizer that you bought at the local you know, farm and fleet. And then we, we had other model inputs that included the proximity to the threshold impairment, how much of the watershed was disturbed, its trend in water quality and lake size. And for each lake then we could give a score from 100 to zero, low to high, in a priority ranking from high, higher, and highest. Again, there's no lake that has low sensitivity to phosphorus. And then we also, uh, which is really important here and probably we didn't appreciate the importance at the time, for each lake, we would provide a, 
a suggested phosphorus load reduction goal is 5% reduction in pounds of phosphorus per year. So for those visual uh, learners, here's a quick visual of that framework. It's a multiplicative um, um, values-based model uh, that also includes an additive component. And here are some of the results of some of this. So here's the sensitivity again, inches lost and in, in water clarity with 100 pounds of phosphorus. So we, we could give that value for every lake in the state where we had chemistry and some basic um, attributes of the lake. We could then give a score, again, high, higher, and highest. And here's Itasca County in Northern Minnesota. It could show you, you quick, can quickly look, if you're a county commissioner, you can quickly look at those darker colored ones. Those are the lakes that have the highest phosphorus sensitivity significance. And then here's its, here's its phosphorus sensitivity and it just lost again. You can look at a particular lake. Here's Blue Water Lake. You would lose seven to eight feet of water clarity loss. That's predicted loss with 100 pounds of phosphorus with a goal for the lake association, for the county, whatever of four pounds per year of phosphorus load reduction. So that would be the goal for the year. And you can see a wide range of values across uh, a county rich area. So uh, the third tool, second tool is the lakes of biological significance. This was really simple. It's based on our dedicated biological sampling, both for fish, aquatic plants, birds, and amphibians. So we uh, aggregated all this data went through a peer review process and then identified the, biologi the uh, biological lakes of significance that the state really was interested in protecting because of those biological features. So here are those lakes across Minnesota, outstanding, high and moderate. And then the third, the third um, tool was, um, was benefit cost ratio. So the benefit is, is in dollars. Now, when you buy a lakeshore home, you're not given a price for the fact that you're living on a clearer lake than, than one down the road. You have to infer it from the differences in prices. It's called it hedonic um, economic models. And that's what we did for Minnesota. We tried to predict land values based on the lake's mean phosphorus, total phosphorus in pounds per, or in dollars per shoreline feet. So what we found was land value is higher with lower total phosphorus, which is consistent with other ecological models of, of this nature. Land value is higher with bigger and deeper lakes. People like bigger lakes and they're willing to pay more. And then lastly, location, location, location. Um, where the lake is in reference to the metro area or closer um, micro, uh, micro metallitan, um, cities, the, the more the supply and demand, I guess. So we could get calculate the land value in dollars per shoreline feet. Our benefits were total land value increase for a lake with a 5% reduction in phosphorus. And our costs were based on literature values, depending on the land use. So fairly cheap for ag at $18 per pound, residential more because you often don't have the space to do best management practices. And the the best management practices are expensive. And then forest with conservation easements at 60% of the land value. And then we also had some multipliers, the probability of feasibility and the probability of willingness to, to do it. So we could calculate a benefit cost ratio. The higher the benefit cost ratio, the greater return on investment. So here are those um, uh, values uh, across, across Minnesota. The benefits were really large, often exceeded a million dollars for some of our lakes. Uh, and the costs really varied by uh, the land use. It's often cheaper to, to do that in the forest areas and uh, become more expensive in, in the residential as expected. So if you're a county commissioner, you're looking at where am I gonna get my greatest return on investment? There they are, there's the highest ones identified. and. Uh, there's ones that are less. So with regard to answering the question about um, which lakes with the low benefit cost ratio, well, impaired lakes have 
really higher cost. If restoration focused in on the top 100 benefit cost ratio in Paired Lakes, then the cost would equal about $80 million and the benefits would be about $34 million. If you took that same $80 million and selected the best benefit cost ratios without regard to impairment status, you could do 198 lakes versus the 100, of course. And the benefits would be 200 million versus the 34 minute million. So we found that there was a six times greater return on investment if we focus in on high benefit cost ratio lakes rather than focusing on impaired waters. Not to say, however, that there aren't impaired lakes that have uh, low benefit cost ratios. In fact, we find that there are some, especially associated with the metro area that have really high benefit cost ratios, but you have to be selective. So just using impairment status is where you're gonna spend the money may not be the best use of your dollar. So when we have been giving uh, guidance back to state agencies and local units of government, we say, think about giving higher pri priority lakes that are large, that are sensitive to phosphorus loading, that can be protected with very cost benefit strategies, especially shoreland, forested shorelands, or even the flip side or in cities that are highly developed. Um, they often have a great return on investment because um, they're so cherished in those, in those locations. And I didn't show this, but we, we found high value for those lakes of biological significance as well. So we, you know, we came to the conclusion that invest a greater share of our limited dollars in Minnesota for lake protection and less on those impaired. We'll get a higher return on investment can be achieved where those investments are at, are up, excuse me, a higher return investment, return on investment can be achieved through investments up, up on high quality lakes at, at risk. So I walked through the tiered process that we have identified to prioritize lakes. You know, talked about the lakes of phosphorus sensitivity significance, the lakes of biological significance and using benefit cost ratios and various benefit cost assessments and how you need to work with, with strong advocates in the communities and collaborate with citizens like associations and SWCDs and, and other folks such as land trusts in our case, the four cases that I, I showed. So that I showed an example how you prioritize lakes. You would use the same kind of process to prioritize a project at the, at the lake scale. So you've already identified your lake. You'd wanna do that same science, right? Okay, now what kind of projects can I do on, on this lake? Where am I gonna get the max higher benefits for my cost? So it's my benefit cost ratio. Many SWCDs here in Minnesota have great calculators that can, that can do that kind of analysis to say, oh, this best management practice on this stormwater um, source is will be more uh, get a greater return on investment than another project down the road. So think about using the same framework once you've identified the lake and start working on projects, and then start playing the long game because you're going to need to persevere, you're going to need to endure, and you're going to need a lot of patience to get this done. And sometimes the gears move very slowly at first. But um, once they start going, you've got momentum on your side and you can do incredible things once you uh, amass uh, your advocates and your collaborators. So I want to thank you for your attention through this. Um, the reference here I, I show uh, talks about the second half of the presentation. Uh, please uh, get that. And if you want to contact me with um, some questions or some comments, there is my email. So with that, Joe, I think we could um, jump into questions, I think. Excellent, thank you so much, Paul. And that was really interesting. I've got a, a bunch of questions myself. And so um, I, I can ask you a bunch of questions, but I'll first let you get a drink of water and I'll remind our um, attendees that you can uh, submit a question to Paul in the question and answer box. So if you just hover your mouse over the, the screen here, there's a little Q&A um, with some word bubbles. Type your answer and your question in there and uh, 
and we will get Paul's feedback on it. So um, I'll keep an eye on those. Um, but while we're waiting for questions to come in, I, I do have some. So Paul, I guess I'm curious, um, you know, with any prioritization system like this um, being coordinated and implemented by a state agency, uh, you know, often there are public outreach meetings and, and um, hearings and that sort of thing to, to get public feedback. So I'm curious how, what sort of um, listening sessions you guys did as you developed and implemented this and, and how it was received, if you got any pushback from it. Um, no, I didn't get, we didn't get any pushback. Most of our efforts are focused in at the county level. In Minnesota, we have a watershed planning process. They call it the one watershed, one planning process here in Minnesota. Um, and we've been working uh, with those planners that are putting together the plan to help them at the watershed le level to prioritize lakes for their investment. And since we're starting at the grassroots, um, they're they're anxious for more information. They're anxious for this kind of data. They were, they were very pleased, and often they would they would run way ahead of the data, or run with the data much more than I anticipated. So it was uh, it was, I would go to their their planning sessions, present the kind of information, show those county graphs or at the watershed scale more often the case, and show them lakes that within a particular watershed and say, oh look. You've got some some really outstanding lakes. It might be because of the biological community, or because of the phosphorus sensitivity, and then we would have discussions about that. And they would continue on through their planning process and identify um, those lakes that they thought they should should advance within their plan. So when they got money, that they would work then on those lakes, and they would often then take the next step to saying oh, here are the projects we'd like to do on those lakes. And they would use their own cost benefit assessments to design those projects, at least flush them out initially within the plan. So it was, it was good. We haven't spent a lot of time working at, at larger scales, like at the state scales, at the state scale. Of course, we've given those presentations, but um, you know, our framework right now, all based on watershed planning, I think constrains, uh, say, policymakers or politicians to think a little bit differently. So they're allocating money to these watersheds. And some of that's just purely political, right? Let's disperse the money across the state in an equitable manner. And that's fine. But at the same time, we've been advocating in, in the, this part of the state that say, wait a minute, we've got some really great lakes that haven't been screwed up yet. There's a strong case to be made, both economically and ecologically and environmentally, that we should protect those lakes and put a greater emphasis on, on protection now, rather than trying to clean up the lakes in the south and the southwest, which, which in many cases is not going to be possible. So we were having those larger discussions. I think that's where some pushbacks occurring because that's counter to the way the state used to dole out money, right? Whoever's the strongest politician would make sure they would get some of the piece of the pie. So I think that's the next challenge we face is to say, how can we move some of this money to those areas that are risk? You know, there's, there's agricultural conversions that are occurring in some of these places that really have outstanding lakes. Maybe we should think about investing there. Good question, thanks. Thanks. Well, that's a really informative answer. And I think it sort of dovetails into another question that we've got. So in your, one of your opening slides, you mentioned some of the different ways that those funds can be uh, distributed. And, and one was that those with more resources get more resources. Um, and so it's, as you mentioned, um, you know, having that political uh, power or maybe the local capacity, um, all of those things can help. Um, and so certain lakes, can sometimes have a reputation for getting things done um, in part because they have a lot of resources um, and though they tend to then get more resources to be more successful in grant, grant writing and all of those sorts of things. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about how your recommendations help to address this? Yeah, within our, 
benefit cost ratio, we had two probabilities that were somewhat subjective, but based on, on actual some data. So the probability of feasibility and the probability of will, willingness. And uh, we based that willingness based on the wealth <laughs> of the community around the lake. So there's a case where they have high resources. There's probably a willingness to invest. You know, they, they appreciate their lakes. Um, they've got the capacity to do something. They might even have a history of doing their own science and bringing in con um, environmental consultants to help them along the way. So we built that into our benefit cost assessment, um, which you should probably do. Um, and then the feasibility was, was also, and I forget what it was based on, I'd have to look back on the paper, but it was based on some social element of the community. So that you should include those kinds of things, right? Because you don't want to do a project where you know nobody is interested as well. So that should be part of the calculus in some way and try to be as objective, at least transparent about how you're doing that. So yeah, you should include those kinds of things when you're doing those kinds of assessments. And it may it may be crude, but um, and many people have a sense of where you know they have the resources and they've demonstrated in the past uh, the ability to get things done. So you shouldn't ignore those places at all. In fact, you may want to funnel some of that, some of that energy to those areas because there might not be any capacity at, at some of these lakes to do anything, or there's, there's no willingness for it. Maybe they're happy with what they got. So yeah, include those two things. Good, I'm going to, I'm going to shut off my, uh, or stop sharing. Is that okay, yeah. Joe? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, we've got a few handful of questions here from uh, the participants. Um, so how is climate change influencing your prioritization tools? Well, in the, the Cisco one, it, it def it's built right in. So that's a very easy one to explain. In the other cases, not so much. Like the lakes of phosphorus sensitivity, not at all. Although we update that on a regular basis. So as, so we're seeing increases in precipitation and increases in extreme events in some of these watersheds. So we're using that hydrological data within our limnological models so that the models are updated on, a, on an annual basis to include that kind of information. But, uh, I would say it's it's probably insufficient. We don't include a lot of those risks in the other kinds of things that we're looking at. For example, where do we expect wild rice to be within 50 years? You know, where is that epicenter going to be? Is it going to migrate north? And we've saved some of it in uh, in, in areas that maybe are not going to be very good areas in the future. So, I think. I think we have to do a better job of including that science in all the things that we do. Um, besides the Cisco example, I think we need to build it in to other things. Now with the lakes of biological significance, we update that list on a five year basis. So we have plans to circle back on that and using, using the client science on how it influences plants and animals, I think is something that we should incorporate in our next iteration of that tool. Okay, thanks. Um, question, uh, so you're promoting long range lake protection and uh, this person, Greg, wants to know what outreach do you feel is important with younger generations that don't ordinarily participate in lake associations or property ownership? In other words, do you have any thoughts about reaching people um, in the younger generations, 20 and 20 or less? Oh, that's a great, that's a great challenge. Um, you go to a lake association meeting, you're talking to 65 plus. Um, you're talking to a bunch of white hair people that have lived a, a long life and have been often very successful in life and now are wanting to to do something positive to protect their lake that they've enjoyed for their whole life. And um, their kids or their grandkids aren't at that meeting. Um, and uh, 
I think we as an agency have struggled with that is, is how do we bring that generation in? Is, and is it even possible? I mean, over my career, 35 years, it's always been that way. My first initial meetings with Lake Association, it was all, <laughs> always the older group. And um, that hasn't changed any. But the nice thing about that older group is they're smart, they've got time, and they're doing it for their families. They're doing it for their children and their grandchildren. So indirectly, they're incorporated already, in my mind, even though they're not at the table. They're represented by their grandfather as those discussions about prioritizing work are happening. So maybe that's the best we can ex expect. I don't know. Have you have you have you had any luck with that? I I certainly struggle with it. I know when we have fishing regulations, you know, bag limits or any regulations, we'll get we'll get younger folks that are you know are actively fishing. But but on some of these long game issues where we're talking about protecting watersheds, lake sheds, and the lakes themselves, it's people that have some time, and it's unfortunately it's not it's not like my daughter who has no time because she has kids and is working. So, but I've come just to accept that that's okay. Do the best you can with the people that show up. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You have to target, you have to target the people that are willing to, to work with you. Um, okay, let's see. We've got a uh, six questions still outstanding. So, um, how can we convince Michigan to undertake this approach to conservation? This is a person probably from Michigan. Curious um, how Michigan might take the lead from Minnesota. Well, um, that's for the Michigan folks to decide. I'm sure. I'm sure there's Michigan's doing a lot of great work. I've I've seen a lot of the stuff that Joe that you're putting up about the work that's being done on Michigan with regard to um, protecting shorelines, for example. I think we learn by, and this partnership is a great example of bringing different perspectives and different experiences together and learning from each. So I'm listening to stuff that's happening in Michigan and going, oh, I got to replicate that here in Minnesota. That's a great idea. You know, that social marketing of natural shorelands, the programs that Michigan has, oh, that's that's good. And we need to think about building on that, that work that's been, been done elsewhere. And if you see something in that, oh, okay, cost benefit, can that help me prioritizing lakes or prioritizing projects? Um, you know, those tools have been out there for a while. We've shown how you might want to use that to prioritize for a lake rich area such as Michigan. So you might have already done some of that work already and or maybe can learn something from our mistakes here in Minnesota. But um, through the partnership, I think. I think we're learning about other folks, and I think that's that's where that's where we can take advantage of this. Yeah, well, well, thank you for giving a plug to the partnership, and that's you know exactly one of the things that we're trying to do with these webinars and and with some of our outreach is trying to share the neat uh, and innovative approaches, whether it's science or management or outreach that others are doing across the partnership um, so that we can all learn and be inspired by those things together. Right. I gave the cost benefit part of the talk to uh, Wisconsin, the Wisconsin um, Lake Extension Group. So they got a Lake Leaders um, workshop series that they have in, in Wisconsin. And they're trying to replicate some of the cost benefit for, for Wisconsin to help them steer towards prioritizing which lakes across the state of Wisconsin. So, and I'm sure they're, they're going to learn from our mistakes and do something different, but taking that same kind of idea and, and spreading it within Wisconsin, I think that was good. Good. Okay. Um, question here. Um, so if most of the problems are coming from these non-urban areas and you're doing most of your work with the counties and soil and water conservation districts, why is there then so much historical pollution coming from the areas? Uh, is there a problem with the system uh, and how you're approaching it? Or um, why are the 
why is the pollution coming from the areas that um, tend to be working with? Well, as whenever, whenever you disturb the land and increase the impervious surfaces, you're gonna increase the runoff. And with runoff, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have sediment and the phosphorus is gonna to attach to that sediment and slowly reach its way because the lakes are at the bottom of a watershed. Slowly but surely that, that pollution enters the lake. So anytime you disturb and alter the land, you're going to have these problems. Um, some places in Minnesota, there is a legacy of past wrongs. So um, a, an example here in Crow Wing County with some of our lakes was um, sewage was um, sewage effluent right into, right into flowing water, which might have gone into a, a wetland, which then flowed into a lake. And you have these legacy consequences that you then have to think about best management practices to, to keep that phosphorus in those smaller basins where possible. Um, but much of our work deals with making sure that uh, that water gets infiltrated into the ground near where it falls. So when I tell lake homeowners, okay, let's look at your, let's look at your property. Let's look at your house. Where are the gutters? Is the, is the outflow of the gutter going straight down to the lake? Um, oh, you've got lawn, you've got a lawn to the water? Oh, well that, all that water is just ripping right down, right down because it has a high runoff coefficient. So it's all running right into the lake. So it's picking up soil particles, leaf matter, uh, anything that has phosphorus attached to it and entering right into the lake. So you have to think every drop of water, where is it coming from? How is it getting to the lake? And if it's getting to the lake unfiltered, then it's likely to have phosphorus associated with that runoff. Um, in our urban areas, we've got um, huge challenges where there's a lot of impervious surfaces, stormwater um, sometimes is untreated or poorly treated, and it ends up discharging into flowing water that ends up in lakes. So those, those become very big challenges and requires really strong engineering skills to, to solve some of those problems. But they're both, they're all because how we treat the land. So how you treat it as a, as a lake homeowner, uh, how your city treats it, how your forest is managed, how it's cut, is it protecting some of the riparian buffers, et cetera. Is it ag land? Uh, do they have shoreline buffers around their ditches and flowing waters? Uh, are they over fertilizing, et cetera? All those things have a consequence. Every person has a consequence to that watershed. So it's looking back and finding those big sources of phosphorus and then doing something about them. Excellent, thank you. Um, Here's a somewhat easier, more straightforward question. Is there a place that they can, that people who are interested can download a copy of this um, presentation, the slide deck? Uh, not at the moment, but you recorded it. And uh, I could think about putting it on my books website as well. So I, I'll think about that. Yeah, well, that, that's a great segue. And just a reminder, we will record this and post it to the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership website, um, probably in about a week or so. Yeah. Um, and then um, if you would like to reach out to Paul, um, feel free to uh, use his email. It was um, on the last slide there. And um, I will CC Paul uh, when I email out the link to the um, webinar recording. And so if you want to follow up with them with questions, you can reach out to them at that time as well. Um, is there a spreadsheet for the lakes uh, phosphorus sensitivity significance available on the DNR website or somewhere, or should they just reach out to you directly? Um, we've got the data at MinGeo, so if you're good at spatial analysis through some of the GIS tools, it is available readily. But yes, there's also a spreadsheet that I can send people as well. I don't think that's available on a DNR website yet, 
but uh, if you're interested in right away, I can get it to you. Probably the next iteration, there will be a web page for it as well. But yes, there is a spreadsheet. Just get in, talk, in contact with me and I'll send it to you. Great, thanks. And somebody, Annette Drews, well, I, I'm guessing you might know, mentions that the data are also available at the WHAF. I don't know what that stands for. That's the uh, WAF tool, the Watershed Health Assessment Framework, which is a Minnesota tool. So anybody with a browser, internet browser can get these data as well. So thanks Annette, that's a great idea. For those that want to zoom in on their lake, go to Minnes just type in at Google, Minnesota DNR WAF, W-H-A-F, I guess. And uh, then you can find that data as well. So thanks Annette. Great, thanks Annette. Um, and she mentions that the benefit cost is not in the database yet for that tool. Okay. Um, next question is, is there approximate minimum shoreline length to give an easement for protection? I'm guessing that depends on the county and, and who's doing the easements. That's correct. Um, so for Minnesota, we've got two land trusts now, the Minnesota Land Trust and then the Northern Waters Land Trust. And they're, they're often seeking... Um, larger shoreline segments. So if you've got a property that um, is fairly large, I would, in, and you're interested in leaving your own legacy, I would, uh, I would send them an email or call them and see if, uh, if uh, your property meets their minimum size. I know it really varies. It really, you know, there are some very unique habitats that they're interested in preserving. So, so I think they're somewhat flexible on that, but they don't do a lot of very small parcel protections because the administrative cost, because they do annual checks on those properties to make sure that they're complying with the easement, that they're often looking for a little bit bigger properties than say maybe you know a short segment of shoreline. So please contact them and, and uh, they can give you a sense of that. They're great people to work with. If, if you're thinking about conservation easements, um, they, they write that easement with you and your family um, to make sure that they capture your interest. So it's, um, it's a really back and forth discussion. And, uh, and I know people have been very satisfied going through conservation easement and having the relief that they're protecting that place that they've always enjoyed forever. So really give that some serious thought. It's a great, a great way to protect Lakeshore. Okay, thanks. Um, we have one person that mentioned in reference to your answer, um, I think about um, grandfathers maybe being uh, strong advocates that uh, you should also remember the grandmothers out there. Oh. Yeah. Grandmothers, yes, They're, in fact, in many like associations, they are the key to keeping those going. So right, grandfathers and grandmothers. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, yep. my, don't want to shortchange my, my the bias. grandmothers out there. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay, um, I think that is all the questions that we have. Um, we have one more comment saying, thank you, your presentation was informative and well-organized. And I think that uh, sums up pretty well um, how many people felt we had uh, something like 70 attendees here today. And I want to say on behalf of all of them, um, thank you from the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership for uh, sharing this information with us. And, you know, whether we're in Michigan and wondering whether we can start to implement some of these things in Michigan or, or wherever we are, um, I think this is great information and a good jumping off point for us as we seek to conserve and protect our own lakes. So, um, so thank you, Paul. And again, um, I'll remind everyone, I will be emailing out um, to all of the registered attendees a link to this recording along with Paul's email. And I'd encourage you to check out um, all of the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership webinars that are upcoming. Paul referenced a few um, from Pete Jacobson um, and um, Derek Barr and Wilbur Shard, both on uh, Cisco and, and Lake Protection. And, and then there'll be um, 17 others as well. So uh, quite a few coming up. Thank you all and um, have a good day.